Money FM 89.3, best of weekends. Looking uh, to 2021 and the markets in 2021, investment trends, what to watch out for if you are an investor or wanting to become an investor in this coming year. What do you look out for? Joining us to talk about that, Jeff Halley, the senior market analyst at Oanda, uh, a regular contributor here on Money FM. Jeff, welcome to the show. Good morning. Happy Sunday. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, guys. Good to be here. Great to see you. I, I believe you're in uh, Jakarta today. Is that correct? Are you in your home? Yeah. I'm, uh, I, I, in, in, in normal times, I work between here and Singapore, but uh, these aren't normal times, so it's been <laughs> most of the year in Jakarta. Certainly nothing normal. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Jeff, when we look at the year past, you've done a lot of looking backward, I know, in recent weeks on Money FM, but let's look forward and talking about uh, some uh, investment trends that you might see, what should we be looking at when it comes to making decisions about where to invest or where not to invest in the coming year? Well, I think, uh, Glenn, the key words here are zero percent. And that is about the level that interest uh, of interest rates that central banks around the world are going to keep monetary policy at. So it'll be about zero percent, not too far off in uh, the U.S. It's negative in uh, Europe. We have 0% interest rates effectively in countries as far away as Australia and New Zealand, all over the world. Central banks are going to continue flooding the world's financial system with free money. This means that obviously our savings in the bank earn no interest whatsoever. So this hunt for yield will go on. And this money is going to flow into uh, markets that do give us some sort of return that means equities. So we've seen this asset price and appreciation or inflation occurring in 2020. We're going to go and see more of that in 2021. I'm fully expecting that stock markets uh, will be much higher by the end of 2021 uh, than they are today. Does that mean, Jeff, that it would make sense for individual investors, for example, to look at, at buying real estate if they, don't, if they haven't already or if they want to buy more real estate with money being basically free, low interest rates, uh, getting loans and things like that and access to money would be quite easy for people? We're going to see more of that as well. I mean, if you look down in New Zealand and even to a lesser extent in Australia, record low interest rates, even though there's been this COVID-19 pandemic and recession globally, house prices have uh, been on fire down there. Uh, certainly in Singapore, uh, I would expect the property market to remain uh, quite well supported. There's a few other factors going on there. There's a lot less expats to, to hold, hold up the rental market, et cetera, et cetera. But certainly uh, real estate is one thing that you should be thinking about in your uh, investment portfolio, especially when the banks are affected effectively giving you the money for nothing. You know, this is yet another area that we're going to see more appreciation in. And Jeffrey, with the gradual vaccine rollout for COVID-19, do you see a wait and see approach to see which kinds of stocks you invest in or do you think the time is now? How do you think the COVID-19 in 2021 and the vaccine is going to affect investments? Well, look, I, I think COVID, the, the COVID-19 vaccines will be a game changer for the world, particularly this AstraZeneca one that got approved the other day by the UK. It's a room temperature one. It doesn't mm. have to be stored in conditions resembling the South Pole of the Antarctic. And a lot cheaper. Uh, to be moved around. <laughs> and, and a lot cheaper. I, I expect we're going to see some more of those coming to the market. We're starting to see the, the Chinese vaccines appearing as well, although their data isn't appearing with them. Look, but it's not an instant panacea. Yep. I actually do believe we may see it get worse before it gets mm. better. But I think by the end of Q1, we're going to start seeing some impact. And by the end of Q2, we're going to start seeing some noticeable impact as they achieve that critical mass of vaccinations and populations and, and developed countries, particularly around the world. So I, I think that the global recovery will definitely gather steam as these vaccinations get wider distribution and supported by this bottomless amount of 0% money from the central banks, particularly the central banks. They want to see the economy overshoot. They're not really worried about inflation at the moment. They want to see uh, escape velocity occur this time uh, before they start even considering reeling back 
uh, all of that free money. Talking with Jeff Halley, of course, senior market analyst at Oanda, and, and Jeff, as you as you just talked about that Q1, Q2 uh, rebound of sorts uh, that that we may see, that would also indicate that industries like shipping or even tourism, uh, transportation, airlines, mm-hmm. many of those would be primely you know in a prime position to bounce back and to be a beneficiary of that, w- would they not? I think we have to be a bit careful about airlines. I think airlines may be subject to short-term spikes higher as optimism builds, but air travel as we know it is not returning anytime soon. You were waving your yellow vaccination card before (laughs) uh, booklet. I have one as well, and it is absolutely full of uh, vaccinations because I used to travel to Africa quite a bit. Mm. That will be the way of the world. If you want to travel in the world to book an airline ticket, you will have to have a vaccination certification of some description. If you want to book a hotel overseas, you'll have to do that. If you want to travel between countries, you'll need to have that certification. If you're not going to get vaccinated, then you know, you'll be staying at home in your own country. These processes will all add blockages, shall we say, to yeah. airline finance because simply not as many people will fly. I think air travel will also come back quite a bit more expensive than what we're used to as well because there will be a lot less budget airlines. So I think we need to tre- we need to tread carefully Uh, with airlines. But we're starting to see this movement in these cyclical stocks right now, these cyclical sectors, banking, property, perhaps some of these legacy, uh, I call them non-working from home industries. We look at ASEAN this year, it has underperformed the northern part of Asia. And I think the main reason for that is because when you look at ASEAN stock markets, they're full of what I call legacy industries, property, leisure, consumer discretionary, banking, telcos, utilities, all that stuff. They don't have a lot of tech-heavy companies in them. But I think that ASEAN markets will outperform this year. They'll play catch-up as that world recovery gathers pace. And, Jeff, what impact do you think the Brexit uncertainty will have on markets, in the, certainly in the first couple of quarters? I think it really depends on whether we have thousands of trucks stuck uh, on each side of the English Channel waiting for bureaucratic paperwork to go through and whether I'm sure that Europe has no interest in starving England and and, uh, blocking fresh produce being delivered and and things like this. You know, the first couple of days, from what I can tell, despite all the doom-mongering that we saw beforehand, it's actually been proceeding reasonably smoothly. However, it's a very quiet time of the year. So uh, the proof in the pudding will probably be when those volumes pick up later this week. I think for the first month, there's going to be a few nerves because officials and the bureaucracy on both sides of the channel will be finding their way and building efficiency into their processes. But I think that the actual Brexit agreement itself wasn't a bad agreement for uh, for Britain. And uh, so I, I... I mean, the pound has been undervalued for most of the year and UK stocks have underperformed. So frankly, I think that there's some opportunities in that market, assuming that Brexit goes smoothly. And I have no reason to believe that it won't. Just a quick follow up on currencies. I noticed recently that the Australian dollar has had a a strong recovery. It's it's gone past parity with the Singapore dollar. Uh, I believe that's due to the steel imports, uh, exports, sorry, to uh, China and some growth there. How do you see the Singapore dollar sort of doing in the next couple of months or so? I think that the Singapore dollar is going to appreciate this year, so it's going to get stronger. So when we do actually manage to finally go on holiday, our holidays will get cheaper. You know, Our Singapore dollars will go further. Uh, the US dollar will weaken this year, and because the US dollar is going to weaken all through 2021, and that is because of their twin deficits, probably a more spending, a, a government that's intent on doing more fiscal stimulus, and as uh, investors rotate out of defensive US dollar positioning back into the world in 2021 as it recovers, the dollar is going to depreciate. That will see all uh, Asian currencies continue to strengthen. And when you look at the markets, Asian currencies really have performed very well this year. So I'm expecting the the Singapore dollar to keep uh, strengthening along with some of its regional pairs. I believe the Singapore dollar, Malaysian ringgit, Indonesian rupiah, they're going to have pretty good years this year, having underperformed in 2020 by comparison to, say, the ringgit or the Thai baht or the Korean won. 
Yeah, we're already seeing, especially the the Singapore dollar, uh, quite strong against the U.S. dollar. Yeah, uh, in this past week or and so, and holding its own against the British pound as well. Yeah. Most definitely. So that'll be interesting once once some of the travel lanes open up again uh, to see uh, if people are taking advantage of that. Uh, uh, Jeff, more uh, more close to home here in Singapore, we just had the announcement of the high speed rail project being canceled uh, for now. Uh, is that being factored into any investment? Had that already been factored into any investment? Investment decisions, um, even though the, the project was just underway, it had not really, you know, started in full. Is that going to have an impact on any sectors? Do you think? Uh, I, I believe that this decision was fully factored in. Uh, the, the project was in trouble, and it has been sort of in a in a, in a, in a holding pattern yeah. while both sides reassess the uh, the future of it, uh, and it, that's been going on for a couple of years. And that was very well telegraphed uh, under the Mahatha uh, administration when they opened up all the books after the election and saw just how much debt. There was sitting on the books already with uh, one MDB and, and all these factors, and they were very open then that they probably couldn't afford it. That's not got any better, obviously, in 2020, where governments have had to uh, spend lots and lots of money to keep the lights on uh, mm-hmm. in their own economies. It's Singapore has spent a, a huge amount of money. Malaysia has spent a huge amount of money. And, and so th- these are luxuries that we really can't have at the moment, unfortunately. I, I think they'll come back to this project at some stage because I think it's a great idea. But I think they'll probably revisit it when the world's moved on. So this will be a story for the for the tw- mid-2020s uh, yeah. and not the next few years. Jeff, did Oanda have a, a, a position on the high-speed rail when it, when it first came out in, in recent years in terms of the – potential economic benefit uh, that it might give to both countries. What were you guys saying early on and, and until it was cancelled? It was definitely GDP accretive. I mean, getting to KL in 90 minutes or getting from KL to Singapore in 90 minutes and not having to, you know, schlep through the airports and or drive for five hours up and down the highways. It was definitely going to increase the amount of business that was going on and really open up those borders, particularly with the stop in Iskander, actually which is very quickly becoming almost a satellite city of, uh, mm. of Singapore. I think yeah, there's a definite move strategically from Singapore to put these more labour-intensive industries uh, over in, in, in places like Iskander while keeping you know, the, the, high, the high-tech value-added uh, stuff uh, in Singapore. So, I mean, it was definitely going to add at least a percent to the GDP of both countries uh, from the initial times, but... You know, it's something they can both live without right now. Just briefly follow up on that, Jeff. I know people who live and work from Iskander, the region. You're correct to yeah, say... me that, too. Exactly, yeah. right? You're correct to say it was a satellite city. Mm. I also know people who invested in that area specifically because of the future railway you know, link-up between the cities. So do you mm. think it'll have any impact or slowdown on the Iskander region? I think Iskander region's had its challenges anyway. I mean, they have a property glut because uh, all the Chinese property developers went down there and built these huge uh, amounts of apartments there, mostly sold them to Chinese. Then the Malaysians have changed the visa requirements. Uh, People I know who have gone down there and built, you know, standalone houses. There's some wonderful schools down there. There's some universities. Uh, There's a lot more infrastructure. They're finding it very comfortable commuting back and forth across the causeway each way. I think the real impact is probably been by uh, being felt by those people who bought uh, speculatively bought into these giant apartment developments mm. Mm. and I think that market is going to remain very very soggy for a long time simply because a we've had COVID-19 in 2020 but you know no high-speed rail and just the sheer volume you know, supply and demand so I mean in hindsight and we're all experts in hindsight you know Doing, you know, making investment decisions in Malaysia under the previous administration was always, there's always a political factor that you had to factor into those investments. And I, I think people perhaps got a bit greedy and, and, and didn't realise those risks. I agree. And, and the notion of, a, of an internal high-speed railway from, from Johor up to KL, have you guys commented on that yet and what the either likelihood or the efficacy of that would be? I haven't actually, we haven't commented on that, but my first thoughts are is it's not really going to be 
it's not going to be a goer. I, I, yeah, the prize was Singapore. Yeah, it's linking KL and Singapore. And, and I think there's a lot more value to be added in either building yet another bridge over the over the over the Singapore over the strait, yeah. mm. or you know as they're working on now extending the MRT over there, making it much easier for Singaporeans to go over to uh, Johor and for a lot of those people Malaysians in Johor to, to easily you know transit over to Singapore because there's a huge number of Malaysians who live in Johor who commute daily to work in Singapore and they're a very important part of the labor force in Singapore. Sure. So anything that makes that process simpler and moving freight over and back and forth, I think, you know, there's a lot more mileage in having a, a smaller scale rather than connecting capitals, making that whole Iskander Singapore area more efficient. Jeff Halley, Senior Market Analyst, Oanda, thanks so much for your time and your look ahead at uh, 2021 and investment trends that we should all look out for. Appreciate it. Happy New Year, guys. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thanks. Have a great day.